time guest, I promise you we won't run to your house and beat down your door and, you know, harass you and all of that kind of stuff, but we would like to let you know that we appreciate that you have come. Also, it's a great way for you to connect with the church if there's some area you're interested in, something you're interested in, or some prayer request that you might have. Just put it on here, and it'll get emailed out sometime during the week, uh, and if you want to just don't want that email out to everybody... Just mark that area where it says, just please share with pastor and staff only, and we will not uh, send that out, but we will pray for you. Also, the offering envelope is in there. I uh, encourage you to use that. If you was at Vision Night the other night, you heard them, they kind of did a little uh, rap thing, and it was, 
snap your finger. One of the lines was snap your finger and write a check. Amen. Yeah, no, so here, snap your fingers. All right, can you snap your fingers? Amen. Now write a check. Amen. I, I'm having a little fun with that, but it'll be all right. I'll guarantee you we'll take it and, uh, and we'll use it for uh, the glory of the Lord. Or you can give online. Also in there is kind of some updates on splash stuff that's going on. Take a moment and look at that. On the back side of that little insert are some volunteer areas that we uh, still looking for help in. Listen, at Riverwoods Church, if you're not volunteering, it's not because we won't let you. You say, well, I wrote it down, and they didn't get a hold of me, this, that, and the other. If you're really serious about volunteering, you'll make sure that we get a hold of you. You know what I mean? But if you put it on there, Jonathan Smith, if you give us the information of how to contact you, uh, you know, uh, he'll get a hold of you and then get you in connection with the right people the area that you're interested in serving in. One of the things that I left off there was our tech team or our media team. They're always looking for some more help in that area. That's the booth uh, back here. And so if you're interested in that, you can just write, make sure your name, phone number, email, contact information is on that connection card. And then write down the area that you're interested maybe in helping in. And I will say this, need you to know something. There are some areas in the church that, like usher, greeter, that kind of thing, you don't have to be a member. If you're interested in working in the splash area, they're doing training today, right after the service. Uh, you have to do a breakdown check if you work with that or you. There are some areas of the church, like life group leaders, student ministry leaders, those kind of things. You do have to be a member, and you do have to meet some qualifications as far as what our expectations are about being regular in attendance, do you tithe, those kind of things. And so as you go up into greater responsibility, there becomes greater responsibilities. <laughs> and so uh, understand that. And so they are uh, there. Great thing about today, if you're here, is life group sign-ups. Uh, there is a table out here in the front lobby. Uh, I don't think, I don't know if there's one, but not one, just one in the front lobby. Uh, we're offering uh, the life groups like we typically do, but we are offering another group, and there's several already signed up, Eddie. I noticed I went out there a while ago. Looks like Wednesday night's the popular night for that, and, uh, uh, and we can take several people in that. So if you're interested in doing Financial Peace University, uh, that's also out there. That's really kind of a growth group in the middle of our life groups. But here's what we believe is that God wants us to be good stewards of the resources that he entrusts us with. And I believe that for some of us, the best thing we could do would be go through that. There is, it costs about $100. Uh, if that's an issue and you really want to go through it, uh, talk with us. Maybe you can pay some down. You can pay some each week. I'll just say this. If you really want to take it and you're serious about it, uh, we'll see somehow or another that you can take it. And uh, i just tell you this, you know, maybe do a less, one or two less trips to McDonald's a week uh, and you can be able to afford it probably. And uh, it might be the best thing you've ever done uh, for your life other than come to know Christ as your Savior. Uh, but other life groups are there. We want you to be in a life group. Listen, everybody here should get in a life group. You say, well, I don't know which one to be in. Then come to mine. Amen? Yeah. Uh, all the other life group leaders are like, yeah. And if, if they kind of start getting full, we may create another uh, life group. Uh, we're always, I'm willing to lead more than one, and others are willing to lead more than one. We'll make sure that you can get in uh, a life group. And uh, maybe we can get some videos over the next couple of weeks, people in life groups and what it means to them and uh, really put forth the effort there. Something we got coming up, and uh, you may have was given one of these when you came in or on your seat or on a seat beside you. I see several of them sitting around. It's just a little thing that says Friends Sunday, March 1, 2015. Uh, and here's what we're going to do. We do this typically twice a year. I don't think we did it in the fall this last year, but uh, uh, we are doing it now in the spring. And what we do is we have a Sunday. We're actually going to take two times this spring uh, to invite somebody, really push to invite people to church. One of them is March the 1st. And the other one's April 5th, which is Easter Sunday. But this is the one that I want to focus on right now. This is Friends Sunday. It's actually National Friends Sunday. Um, outreach marketing has kind of started that. I don't know if you know there's a National Back to Church Sunday. Uh, that's in the fall. But then there's National Friends Sunday. And that's coming up March the 1st. So here's what we want to do. We want to make a concerted effort 
to invite people to come to church with us. And here's what I want you to do. If, they, if we just invite them and we don't couple that with prayer, I think we've fallen short. But so here's what we do. If you've been to Riverwoods uh, in the past, you know, is what I want you to do is somebody that you're going to invite to church, I want you to use one of these for each person. I don't want ten names on these. I want one name on each of these. If you've got somebody right now, you're like, man, I, I know somebody needs to go to church. I want to invite them on Friends Sunday. That gives you a natural opportunity to invite them to come to church. Okay? Friends Sunday. I mean, it's not just, it's, it's a special day for friends. You know what? If most of you invite your friends, you can get some of them to come with you. But if you will invite them and you'll couple that with prayer, and then you also couple that with the church prayer, it's amazing what God will do. So here's what I want you to do right now. Write down at least the one name on this little slip of paper that you will invite on Friend Sunday. And I'd probably wait a little closer to Friend Sunday to invite them. I'd probably spend two or three weeks praying for them. I'd spend two or three weeks putting some money back because if you'll tempt them with dinner, lunch, whatever you call it at the church, you'll have a better chance of getting them here. Amen? And so, I mean, you're like, okay, we're going to go to church, and then after church, we're going to go to Lost Pole, or we're going to go to Ponderosa, or Catfish Kitchen. Now, not, not, you know, <coughs> up it just a little bit, not McDonald's, all right? I mean, you come there getting them to come. All right, I've given you time to write a name on there. Here's what we do. We come and we put those uh, pieces of paper. Just take it and just kind of fold it in half a little bit. We'll have a, 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 a better card next week. I forgot about this at the last moment, so they fill up and stack up. We're going to come and we're going to put their name uh, in this team. You can put more than one name and more than one piece of paper in there. Uh, but if you've got several people, you might want to put a name in there uh, each week or a couple names each week. And then we're going to pray over <coughs> these. Okay? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to come drop your names of who you're inviting to church with you on Friend Sunday in one of these tubes and then just hang out here a moment and then we're going to pray. Okay? I know some of you are like, oh, there, and I don't have any friends. Yeah. Amen. I, that, evidently, you're not inviting them to come with you. You're still seated. Right there. I understand. The great news about that is I'm starting a new series today called Friending. And I'm going to be talking about friendships. Amen. <laughs> uh, and uh, we need it. So uh, let's drop, um, drop them in. And uh, hang out here a minute, and we're going to pray, all right? Ushers can go ahead and get in a position uh, and uh, be ready to take up uh, the offer. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you, Lord, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to worship today. And we thank you for the opportunity to connect with our friends. God, there have been uh, names uh, placed in these tubes. And God, I pray that you'll begin to work in their life now. God, I pray when these people make an effort to invite them that they would respond and respond positively. God, I know there'll be names placed in these tubes, people that need to know Christ as their Savior. God, I pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that you would draw them. God, I pray that they would realize their lostness, their separation, and they will come to know Jesus. God, there are some that's placed in us too that's out of church that know you but is away from you. God, I pray you draw them back. God, I pray when they walk on the grounds here, they wouldn't be impressed with Riverwoods. They'd be impressed with your presence. And when they leave, may they be able to say that they met you today and you met them. And God, you reconnected with them. God, I pray as we make an effort, you bless our efforts. God, we pray for each person. Behind each piece of paper is a name. Behind each name is a person. Behind each person is a soul. Lord Jesus, you gave your life for each and every one of them. God, help us to focus on winning people to Jesus. God, not only would we do that, but as we give money, and uh, God, I pray you take it and use it to spread the gospel of Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you today. Meet with us. Bring glory to yourself. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
day, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that he's worthy. Worthy is the Lamb of God, God I pray, that I bow that knee as a 13-year-old boy, trusting Christ as my Savior. Lord, you changed my life. God, you're worthy. Help me to sing it. As if the angels in heaven were saying, Help me to sing it as if I was standing around your throne today. And spirits and fear is all that you've given me. Experiencing the worthiness. Oh God, I pray today that you'd be glorified through real Woods Church as we sing and lift up our voice. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Come on, church. are important. The most important relationship that you can have is what I call a vertical relationship. That's the relationship between you and God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that is that you know Him as your personal Savior. Can I tell you something? The other relationships are horizontal relationships, and that's the ones that are 
around us. I can tell you this, that when you have Christ in your life, it'll help you have better relationships around you when you follow his teachings and the principles that he gives us. And so what friending and being friends is a big deal. In fact, if you get your friendships right, it can make a difference in your life. A lot of my success has been through right relationships and friendships that I've had with others that I've been able to grow and learn and be advanced in my life. I tell you something, wrong friendships are also can create the most pain that you may ever face in your life. They can create difficulty. They can create destruction uh, more than you can imagine. Here's what I want you to know. You, you, it's on your outline. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. In Proverbs 13, 20 says this, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. What that means, if you have the right friendships, it can influence your life where you can be better than you are now. Almost every time I got in trouble, especially when I was younger, it's because I was hanging with the wrong friends. Friendships are important. I want you to list your five closest friends there today. Now, you, you can't use imaginary friends and you can't use <laughs> immediate family, okay? Uh, and so list your five closest friends. Do you know that you become the average of your five closest friends? Your finances will reflect the average of your five closest friends. What you do with your life will reflect that. I mean, uh, if you have all your friends are wild things, guess what you're probably going to be? You're probably going to be a wild thing. But if your friends are spiritually focused, you'll probably be spiritually focused. And so what our friends influence our life far more than we realize. You know, your mama's probably told you this. I'm, I'm not sure some of you, your mama's told you this, but uh, many of you, you become what you, you run with. Can I tell you something as parents? It's your job to help your kids pick their friends. Did you know that? Uh, you're like, well, my friends can be friends with anybody they want to be. No, 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 no. Uh -uh. Uh, you need to pick their friends for them. There are some friends. I mean, uh, we started watching a movie uh, last night. It was kind of late when we got back home. It's been out a little while called Jersey Boys. And if you watch that, uh, you find out pretty early in that movie that he had some wrong friends that influenced his life. And so I want to define uh, friendship with you here. This is the FBV. You're like, what translation is that? That's the Facebook version. Okay? <laughs> uh, the friend uh, uh, definition, Proverbs 17, 17, and the Facebook version goes like this. A friend is someone you may or may not know well who accepts your friend request on Facebook. This person is born to like and comment on your post to make you feel good about yourself. <laughs> Man, that's right. hey, you, you know, I, I've got a friend or two, and it don't matter who posts, and they'll be the first, they must sit on their phone all the time, because immediately when somebody puts on Facebook, they'll be the first one to like it. And I've asked them, and, and they don't really get it. I've said, do you like everything? Uh, you know, you don't, we don't like everything, right? But I, I want you to know, really, this person, I know them, I know them, well, they don't even realize it. They're craving acceptance, and they like everything that's out there so that people will what feel good about them. I don't tell you what, that's a sick way to understand friendship. Facebook, you know, how many friends have you got? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I've lost a bunch in the last year. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've had a, I'm, my last message in this series before Friend Sunday is unfriending. You know, the best thing that you may do for yourself is to unfriend some people. Did you know that? And we'll come back and we'll deal with that a little bit later on. Let me give you the real solid biblical answer, uh, Proverbs 17, 17. Friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for a time of adversity. You want to know who your real friends are? 
go through a tough time. Amen. You go through a tough time to see who's still around when you get done. That's who your friends were. Uh, the other people, I don't know what they were. Appendages, I guess. They were barnacles. They just attached to you through life. And then, you know, when it got going rough, when the water went down, things got high and dry. They died. I mean, they fell off. Amen. Uh, and, and they go another way. But friendships. Uh, American Sociological Review did a study, and they said this, that the average American has only two close friends. 25% of Americans have no friend. I've been saying this for years, one of the biggest issues I think that the church needs to try to handle, uh, attack, address, however you want to say it, is this thing of loneliness. I think people are lonely. People are lonely today, and the church needs to care about that. You say, Brother Darren, if friendships are going down, why are friendships declining? I'm going to give you three reasons here. I'm going to hit them real quick. I'm going to spend a lot of time on them. Increasing work hours. I mean, we're trying to catch up with the Japanese where we can work 80 hours a week. Amen? Yeah. Increasing work hours. We work more and get paid less. Amen? That's the truth. Or here might be the real issue, and this is just kind of a little caveat here for you. It might be that we're so greedy and so uh, overcome by what we would call materialism that we have to work more to make more so we can have more. Because in America, not only do we uh, associate our success and worthiness by how many friends that we've got on Facebook, we also do it by the possessions that we own. Amen. Can I tell you something? They may be owning us rather than us owning them. And so increasing work hours. How about this rising divorce rate? Did you know that when people go through divorce, it severs a lot of friendships and relationships? There were friends that people had as couples, and then, well, when you divorce, it's kind of awkward for those people you had friendships with before because they're like, all right, if I go with him, she's going to think I'm taking his side. If I go with her, he's going to think I'm taking her side, and, and they don't understand all that. And so here's what happens is they just quit hanging around. It's tough, man. I mean, divorce is tough. It breaks my heart. I'm, I'm not going to divorce. I might commit murder, but I'm not going to divorce. <laughs> yeah. And then here's another reason. And I think this is a big one. We're going to deal with this a whole lot. I mean, if there's any relevant subject that we need to deal with, it's this thing of social media. I mean, we have a social media policy at Riverwood Church. We probably ought to put it on our connection guide so people can read it every Sunday. I know if we put it on there, get to where you don't read it, you just ignore what's on there. Amen? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you've been reading the Connection Guide the last few weeks a little bit different because we've changed it up some. Yeah. So what it draws your attention. And some of you, it's been a long time since you've read those six steps back there. Can I tell you something? You ought to read them every week and remind yourself what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. But the explosion of social media. Would you agree with me that social media has redefined what it means to be a friend? <coughs> yeah, it has. Before Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and all that other stuff, uh, friendships were a lot different. You know, that's people you went and had breakfast with. You know, the sad thing today, and I've watched it as a pastor, I've watched people use Facebook to try to replace personal responsibility and involvement in somebody's life, even in times of difficulty. I mean, I've seen it. I've seen people post and post, but I remember when David Allen was killed in his car wreck right here. I've seen people post stuff, and they never even showed up uh, at the memorial service or anything else. And they, you would think that they were the closest friend by the amount of stuff that they posted on Facebook. You only tell you what that was about. That was not about Tanya. That was not about Drew. That was not about David's family. That was them using that instance to get recognition for themselves in social media. Just tell the truth. Straight up. <laughs> I mean, it's read to find me. We have what become obsessed with controlling our perception. I mean, we want people to perceive us in 140 characters or less nowadays. 
I mean, what, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I can't use a biblical <coughs> verse or reference for this. I don't understand selfies. <laughs> I mean, it's not reality. I mean, there are some of you, you change your selfie five times a day. <laughs> Amen. Are you that obsessed with yourself? Selfie. Selfie. And, and here's what, you know, some of them do. They take it and they frame it and they, uh, you know, do all this work on the picture before they put it on there. That's not reality. That's like going to glamour shots and then putting your picture out there for people to see. I mean, can I tell you something? Glamour shots as good as it's ever going to get. Amen? He ain't marrying glamour shots. Amen? I don't know what guys get. I don't see many guys posting selfies. Geraldo did it, you know, he's the one that kind of, you know, got that craze going. Who in the world? I, I, I don't want to look at a selfie of Geraldo for sure, amen? Yeah. I, but I don't understand it. I'm having a little bit of fun with that, but we filter and frame it. You know, have you ever noticed this? The more friends that we have on Facebook, the more alone we feel. Because it's not how God intended it to be. It is an illusion of intimacy. It is an illusion of what the Bible <laughs> teaches about friendship. In fact, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and all the other social media things, they are a counterfeit of what God intended in relationships. The more I use social media, the more I crave intimacy <coughs> with people. In the upcoming week, we're going to talk about these things, one friend away, one community way, and unfriending. And then on Friend Sunday, we're going to talk about how that God can become uh, your best friend. The friend you need to have is the friend you need to be. Just remember that. Here we're going to talk about recovering the lost art of friendship. First of all is be present. Be present. You say, what do you mean, Brother Dan? Bring presence? No. Be there. Develop friendships. Look at me here. Face to face, not thumb to thumb. And I'm not just picking on, yes, I'm older. Uh, I, I know that. And, and I, just, I just go ahead and tell you, I understand texting and connecting. And sometimes it's really good if you're really busy and you can do that. And you don't get in long, extended conversations and those things. And I, I understand that. But can I tell you something? I'm like one of the comedians that we listen to. Pick up the phone and call them, amen? Or go by and see them. It's amazing. You, you can't read inflection in a text. You can read into it, <laughs> amen? And so we really have to make, can I tell you something? We are losing the ability of how to have relationships and connect with people because of not being there, not being present. Jesus didn't say, read this book, he said, follow me. And what he was meaning is, be present with him. You know what, our kids know that something's not right. In fact, we have more kids complaining about their parents being on their phones than we do parents complaining about their kids being on their phone. Now, I will tell you something. Facebook has moved from what we would call a young generation phenomenon to an older generation phenomenon. In fact, most of the real young people here today, 21 and younger, they're on Facebook, but not much. They found other ways to do it. It's for all of us old cronies, man. You know that? I mean, it's kind of like, you know, MySpace and then Facebook. And it just all drifts to where what older. Uh, I mean, the phenomenon's been between like 35 and 60 uh, on Facebook in recent years. In fact, I, I'm, you say, are you on there? I'm on there. Yeah. And you're on there. And we understand that. And we know that. But I'm going to tell you something. That's not real friendships. Hebrews tells us this in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. It's on your outline. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and to good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Can I tell you what he talks about there in that meeting together? That means actually getting together. In fact, there are many who believe that's talking about the church getting together. <coughs> Not neglect. I mean, if you just show up one Sunday a month, you're neglecting meeting together. Amen? 
I mean, you ought to be together more than that. You ought to be in the last group. Y'all hear Adrian over there? I hear him. I like him, man. He's prettier than either one of his parents. Uh, that's okay. He's a good baby. Uh, but what friendships? There's power in friendships. You've got to be there for somebody. You know what? When somebody dies, <coughs> is it all possible you need to be there? You say, Brother, I don't know what to say. Can I tell you something? You don't have to say anything. You just be there. It'll make a difference. And so there is what we call physically present. You need to physically be present. And then there's emotional presence, and that is that maybe you go up to them and you say, I'm praying for you. And then a step better than that is I'm praying with you. You know, one of the, the things, it's not just a line, it's just a way for me to communicate uh, with people. And here, here's what I've told them. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're having to face this. I'm sorry you're having to go through that. Uh, it makes such a difference. And I, I usually tell them, man, if I could change things, I would, but I can't. And I don't want to see anybody go through pain. Can I tell you what we need to do? We need to be present for one another in difficult <coughs> times, emotionally, physically. When you get to the end of your life, it's not going to matter how many Facebook likes or friends that you've got. What's going to matter is who's there to stand by your side and to be around you. When you go out to eat lunch, put your phones down. Amen? Just pull them away and actually spend time. I, I, just, I just love it. My life used to be this way to me, and so I kind of know how it feels now. And she's not in here to defend herself, but I know some of you are a bunch of rats. And, uh, you'll go tell her just as quick as you can when we get done here but I would say it if she was here and uh, she's she's on her phone way more than me I don't even if you're going to contact me you got to do it through Lincoln or Carolyn or whatever and I've done that intentionally for a while just to kind of withdraw from that and quit insulating myself with that and uh connection with God and some other things. Yes, I'll get another phone and you, I'll be 24-7 access. No, it won't. <laughs> Never have been, won't be. I know how to not answer my phone and turn my phone off. Some people are like, have you ever noticed this? Used to, you know. Uh, years ago when we used to sit on the porch as families and uh, the phone would ring and people would argue about, you know, uh, somebody answer that. You answer. You answer. I mean, now, uh, when the phone rings, it don't matter what's going on. That's high priority. I mean, we break our neck trying to get to the phone. I remember my sister growing up. She always wanted to answer the phone. Amen. She wasn't a big dog about anything else, but she could be a big dog and beat us to the phone. I mean, she'd kill herself trying to get to the phone and answer it. Isn't our life different? I mean, we've got where we have to have a phone with us all the time. We don't know what it is to be still and quiet and connect with God and connect with people anymore. We think we're connecting with this thing in our hand. I mean, there, there are people right now, you need to go to the doctor because you've do, been doing so much on that phone. You've got arthritic joints and carpal tunnel. Amen? Yeah. You're like, I don't know what's wrong with my elbow. You've been holding that phone up here too much. You've been doing this to me. My thumbs and fingers hurt me in cold weather. I mean, we're going to have some physiological aspects and trouble from the result of this. Amen? I'm having a little fun with that, but that's how obsessive we are. You know? Uh, maybe you need to ask yourself, do I have the right friends? And are they present? Not only do we need to be present, but we need to get open. Get open. You want me to break that down Riverwood style for you? You can put out there by the side, just get real. Amen? Just get real. I remember talking with somebody here yesterday, and he had, uh, you know, he was talking about things, and, uh, and, and here's what I told this person. I said, at Riverwood's church, I said, you know, it's talking about coming to the altar and praying and that. And they're like, you know, I, I don't want people to think that I'm prideful. And so I'm going to pray, this, that, and the other. And I said, well, the typical church growing up, it wasn't a pride issue to go to the altar. It took some humility to do that because everybody wants to think there's something. When somebody goes to the altar to pray, they ain't like they're being prideful. They're like, I wonder what they did wrong. 
I wonder what's going on in their life. And I said, but that's not the way it is at Riverwoods. And I said, one of the reasons is, is that we're real. And I said, I'm not trying to put myself up here. I said, I'm trying to bring myself down and expose my weaknesses and my difficulties and my troubles. Because you know the truth, I don't care who it is, we all face them. And so what we try to get down here, we try to get open. Instead of trying to impress people with our strengths, what we need to do is we need to connect with people through our weakness. There's some people that, you know, don't want preachers with valid, uh, valid issues. They don't want somebody who's real and have those issues. i tell you something, they're living in a make-believe world. And I've been, I've been at this thing 30 years. I've been around a lot of preachers. I've been one. I know them. And you know, let me tell you what. I mean, I, I know how to wear the suit. I know how to wear the tie. And I know how to have everything just right and every hair in place and how to do that and how to make you think that I'm up here and I'm next to God when in reality I struggle with the same things that you struggle with. Can I tell you something? When I took off the tie... And the coat and the other things also took off the mask. So here's what I want you to know is we need to learn how to get open. We need to learn how to be real. I think the thing that sets Riverwoods apart is that we can be real. Is that you can come here with your weaknesses and be honest with them. And nobody's going to judge you. We're not going to do those things. Yeah, there becomes times that we have to deal with issues. Don't misunderstand me. But, but the reality is it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what you've done, you can come to Riverwoods Church. Now, I want you to tell you, we love you just like you are, but we love you too much to leave you that way. Amen? And God doesn't want you to stay in the same place. He wants us to change. But one of the ways that we do that is to be real. And to what? Be open about ourselves. Yeah. Our struggles that we face. And so what do we need to do? We need to get open. We need to become real. Some of you need to get in a life group. And you know why? It's because you need to share some of your weaknesses in a life group. Did you know, listen to me now, if all you do is pretend that everything's okay, that's pharisaical, by the way, okay? Uh, if all you do is pretend that you got it all together and everything's okay and there's nothing wrong in your life and you present that to others and you never get real, you never get open, I'll tell you this, you're less of who God intended you to be. You know why? Here's what he says. And don't act like you don't have any faults because you do. Turn to your neighbor and tell them you got faults. <laughs> so if you want to tell them this, if you want to know what they are, just ask me. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. If you want to know what they are, just ask me. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Way to go, preacher. Yeah. James 5.16 says this. It's on your outline. Confess your sins or faults to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. Man, I want you to know God intended us to live in community. And he intended us to be able to share. Our, there's something powerful about that. And so what? We need to have the courage to acknowledge our weaknesses. We need to have the courage to acknowledge what we are doing isn't working. God wants more for us than Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and other social media venues. God has so much more for us and we need what? Connect with people and get open. You need to ask yourself this question, what kind of friend will I be? And John 13, 34, and 35 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love each other. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Well, the greatest testimony that we can give is that we love one another. You know what we do? We stand with people in the ups and we stand with them in the back. We've had people come to church here that's pregnant out of wedlock. And I've said this from day one. I hope every girl in the region that's pregnant out of wedlock comes to Riverwood Church. They're going to be welcome. Amen. We're going to love them. We're not going to say that it's okay to live together and have sex outside of marriage and all that because God doesn't say, say that. He says that that's wrong. And it is wrong to do that. But I'll tell you what's more wrong than that when we as a church shun people and think we're better than them because they're in that relationship. The truth is, 
is that we all are lost. We ought to be in hell with our neck broke. And Jesus died for us. It don't matter who we are, what we've done, where we've come from, and what we need to create an environment and an atmosphere where anybody's welcome. Amen. That's the way it should be. Riverwoods Church. Can I tell you something? Listen to me now. In our region, I still think Riverwoods Church is the best opportunity to reach unchurched people. It really is. I mean, well, I hope that you don't ever feel this way you come here, that you feel like people look at you, who are you, what are you doing here? Can I tell you something? Jesus said, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. That's, that's why we have these here. I, I'll also tell you, probably the doctors, the lawyers, the Snooties, the uppers and the outers and the Bentonites will probably never come to Riverwood Church. Can I tell you something? That's okay. Because there's plenty of places around here for them to go. But there's not many places for anybody and everybody that can go and feel the love of Jesus and feel welcome. You know what? Excuse me. Before we started Riverwood Church, In the time of praying, I said, God, let us start a church and send us to people that nobody else wants. Look what we got. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm serious about this, folks. Man, we need to get real. We need to get open. What kind of friend do we need to be? The kind that gives love. <laughs> Man. Several verses there. Proverbs 20, 20, 12, 26. The godly give good advice to the friends and the wicked lead them astray. Proverbs 27, 5, through, 5 and 6 says, An open rebuke is better than hidden love. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Proverbs 22, 24, and 25 says, Don't befriend angry people or associate with hot-tempered people, or you will learn to be like them and endanger your soul. And you can have toxic friendships, you know. We're going to preach on that a little bit later on in the year. Romans 5, 10 says, For, sincere, for since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. You need to get this. Every friendship ends up somewhere. Few friendships end up somewhere on purpose. We need to create purposeful friendships. And John 15, 13, 15 says, Greater love has no one than this to lay down his life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. Proverbs 20, 26 says, Many will say they are loyal friends, but who can find one who is truly reliable? You know what we need to do? We need to apologize on every, to every person on Facebook. And we need to and I know we can't do that in, in person. Instead of saying, will you like me? You ought to be saying, can I love you? Can I show you the love? The scripture is pretty clear about loving each other and one another. I've given you several verses there that you can look at. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Do you know that? They are. <coughs> Friend loves it all time. The brother's born for adversity. The scripture says, Greater love hath no man than this, and that is that he lay down his life for his friends. <coughs> you know what you need to do? You need to make Jesus your best friend. I'm not talking about get you a bumper sticker and put it on your car that says Jesus is my best friend or get a button or a pen and wear it around that Jesus is my best friend. Uh, most of the people that have that bumper sticker on their car, I want to run over their rear anyway. 
I mean, they, you, you put your hip piece on your car and you run around, you know, flipping people the bird and driving crazy and running up on the rear and all that stuff. Get the thing off your car. Amen. I don't put one on my car. You know why? I understand freeway shootings. Amen. I mean, I do. Somebody see one on my car. Yeah, he's a Christian. Woo-hoo. I'm real. Amen. Get in my way. I run over you. Angry, hostile. Yeah, you are. You, I mean, our society has no patience today. But we wear those things, and it's a mockery sometimes. Amen. You know what I? I you know what I think you'd be better off to do? Just walk around as Jesus for skin on, and then you don't have to advertise it. You don't have to do any of that. And you know what? Some people will see that it's real you have the opportunity to connect with them. You know what our world is longing for today? They're not longing for religion. They're not longing for church. But they're longing for a relationship with God. And they're longing for a real relationship with others. That's what our society is longing for today. It really is. The power of relationships. You know what I've come to learn? is that most people come to Christ because of somebody else. I mean, we've seen a lot of people come to Christ through Riverwoods Church in these six years. It's not been because of my great preaching, though it's good. Thank you, Kevin. The only thing that what's made the difference is people have brought others to church. And the gospel Can I tell you something, River Woods? Our best days are yet ahead of us. Our best days are, are out there. We're the best hope through Jesus Christ for our region. I really believe that. Because we're not going to just go to church. We're going to focus on winning people to Jesus Christ. It's not about getting in here and huddling. It's about getting in here to be what encouraged and built up and fed that we can go back out there let me tell you what it is it's coming here and leaving with the understanding of who we are that we're just saved by the grace of God and it's like one beggar sharing with another beggar where to find food where to find bread man you go to a city and the homeless are there you want me to tell you what the homeless have done they share it with each other where you can get a hot meal they know what soup kitchen's at they know where you can find help you want me to tell you what we ought to leave here and share with others where they can get spiritual not just to say how good we're doing or how big we are, that because people matter to God. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ, let me tell you the first thing you need to do is you need to know Jesus as your Savior. You need to come to know Christ as your personal Savior. Say, Brother Darren, how do I do that? If you're here today, listen, you've got to realize you need Him first. Amen. I mean, you've got to realize you're lost and you're separated and you're a sinner and you can't save yourself. Can I tell you something? Going to, to, to church don't take you to heaven. Being baptized don't take you to heaven. Living good don't take you to heaven. If you could get to heaven by doing all those things, why would Jesus have had to have died at the cross at Calvary? There's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And so if you could get to heaven any other way, why did Jesus, God's very Son, God in the flesh, die on the cross of Calvary? Let me tell you why. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There's no taking away sin. There's no covering it. There's no washing it away itself one way, and that's by blood. It had to be blood from a perfect sacrifice. That's why Jesus was born of a virgin. That's why he lived a sinless life. He's the only one that's lived a sinless life. And he died, buried, and rose again from the dead to save sinners. If you're here today and you've never trusted him as your Savior, you say, well, I believe in I'm talking about. You say, I, I, I know him. Let me ask you a question. Does he know you? If you stood before the Lord right now, listen to me, right now, and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? 
what would you say to him? I'm going to ask you a question. Have you come to a place in your life that you know for certain you have eternal life and that you would go to heaven if you were to die? You say, no, brother Larry, I don't. Well, then you need to get that settled. You say, how do I settle it? I'm glad you're here today. Here's how. It's very simple. It's confessing your condition, turning from your sin, turning to Jesus, asking Him to save you. I tell you something, listen to me now, it's a spiritual birth. <coughs> spiritual birth. So the Spirit has to be involved. The Spirit of God must be drawing you. He must be convicting you. You say, what's that? What's that? I don't understand that. I, I describe it this way. All I know how to do is put it in West Kentucky country terms. If you know what a hall green is, you know, they put it, I believe, in their ears or their nose stop a hog to put it in nose, keep it from rooting. You know? Uh, but you'd say any kind of ring, just it'd be this. There's a ring that's attached to your heart and there's a string tied to it. And here's how you know if the Spirit of God is working in your life. You have a hold of that string and He's pulling you to Himself right now. It's just as if He's got a string tied to your heart and He's on the other end. Like that. He's not yanking. He's not jerking. He's just got a hold of it. And he's just pulling. He's saying, come home. Why don't you come home? So then, yeah, that's happening to me today, Brother Darren. How do I know Christ is my Savior? I pray that. I, I don't understand it. Just what God said, that we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. The heart man believes unto righteousness with the mouth confessions made unto salvation. So what do you have to do? Pray a prayer from your heart to God. The prayer doesn't save you. What do you do in your heart does? Don't ask his head to be bowed. No one looking around this intimate moment. Please, maybe you're here today and you know you need to know Christ as your Savior. Would you come to him today? Say how to do it by prayer. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. You pray this prayer from your heart to God. Dear God, I've come today. Just pray it with me. I know I'm lost. I know I'm a sinner. I know I need to be saved. Lord Jesus, I believe that you, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, was buried, and rose again from the dead. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. Change my Change my life. Save my soul. Lord Jesus, give me a fresh start today. You be my leader. I'll be your father. In your name I pray. No one's looking around. If you prayed that prayer today, you really meant business in Christ. Just come into your life. Just continue. Say, that's me today. Hold it up high until I can see you. Anybody say, that's me today, preacher. I prayed that prayer. I trusted Christ as my Savior. <coughs> By now you know whether or not you did. You know if you've been born again today. You can't crawl from death to life. No, no. Maybe you prayed that prayer in the past. You need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And you need to begin to grow in your relationship with Him. That's some of the first steps He tells you to do. Why in the world do you want to do other things when you haven't done the first thing? That's trust, trust Him completely. Just a moment, we're going to pray and we're going to sing. I'm going to ask you to respond. So please, Father, move in this invitation. In Christ's name I pray. Let's we'll stand. Let's we'll sing. Maybe we'll come and pray for some friends. Maybe you've uh, got some other issue in your life. You come today. Let God have his way.